So as said, uh, I work at ITFA, which is uh, uh, one of the world's biggest uh, documentary film festivals. Um, and it's about to celebrate its 30th anniversary next year. And this year we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the ITFA Doc Lab program. And um, yesterday I showed a buzzword bingo slide from 2007. I skipped that today. Uh, we can do it later. Um, basically, what we look for at ITFA Doc Lab uh, in terms of projects is four main ingredients. Um, we look for projects um, that contain story, that contain an interface, that play with digital data and technology, and that in one way or another uh, use captured reality because in the end we're still a documentary festival. Um, to give you a little bit of uh, uh, an idea of what type of projects uh, we've been show, uh, showing in the past, um, it's been a lot of interactive documentaries and web series, of course, like High Rise, like Bear 71, um, but also Data Art, Jonathan Harris and Seb Comfort's We Feel Fine, Miranda July's Somebody app, um, and around 2010 we started uh, experimenting with our first VR projects. Is this actually working? Can okay. Perfect. Thanks. Um, and besides uh, VR, we've also been interested in all sorts of other new types of technologies, or as William would say, age-old technologies um, that have just come to the surface in a new form recently, um, such as uh, robots. I'm going to ask you some questions. Who do you love most in the world? My mom. I love my mom. My wife. <laughs> what will people remember you for? Uh, a little bit crazy, freaky, generous, small. Tell me something that you've never told a stranger before. So again, we're not going to do that today. Um, I actually have the robot with me, so <laughs> if we have time left. Um, no. <laughs> um, so what do we do with these projects? Um, we are traditionally a film festival, so we're good at show showing projects in dark spaces, uh, linear films mostly on big screens. Um, and when we started the Doc Lab program, uh, it soon uh, got its own competition program. So we have two awards um, at the festival each year, one for digital storytelling and since last year, one for immersive nonfiction. We have a 10-day festival exhibition showing installations and web projects um, in a physical space. Um, we also explore the potential of organizing live cinema events with projects that were sometimes uh, created for the small screen, sometimes specifically created uh, as a live cinema event. And apart from that, we have uh, just like uh, uh, all the usual festivals, we have a market, including for cross media, the called the Forum. Uh, we have a whole range of industry events, uh, an annual conference, and we have a talent program that runs each year. Um, application deadline, I don't know from my top of my head. Um, so if we look at um, the last 10 years that we've been running the program, a lot has happened. Um, and I think one of the main, thing is, main things is that interactive documentary has been growing up. Uh, we've gone to a small ecosystem. It's, it's small, but it's solid, it's international. Um, and I think if we, we have to pinpoint one other thing now that we're here today, I would say it's definitely, of course, the rise of VR. Um, on the hardware front, VR suddenly broke through into mainstream, uh, going from one immersive journalist and a few tech artists and an intern to the biggest elephant in the room of interactive documentary. Um, and rightfully so, VR is a truly new medium that offers something distinctly different from linear films and interactive flat screen experiences. Already we are seeing a first generation of immersive artists emerging and early masterpieces being made and it's a real pleasure to be here today and see many of them actually here presenting. Um, <coughs> that said, there's also a lot of really silly hype around VR, um, resulting in poorly made experiences that don't always justify the huge ask of buying an expensive television helmet uh, or worse. <coughs> and when the bubble bursts, 
And let's be honest, the air is already leaking out here and there. <laughs> Don't worry, it won't blow. <laughs> Um, how do we make sure that we have something substantial to show for? How do we create a wide enough range of meaningful masterpieces to keep immersive moving forward as an art form? What happens when we compare the last decade of interactive storytelling and the current state of VR as an artistic medium? What, if anything, might immersive learn from interactive? It's early days, uh, but we've tried to come up with a few suggestions. <coughs> um, so as we've already heard today, VR can be a next step in the evolution of photography to film to VR, but also a sublime negation of the cinematic frame itself. So to grasp the real artistic potential of VR, we do need to find inspiration in other art forms as well. And really important insights can be found, for instance, if we look more closely at the language of installation art, immersive theater, performance art, radio, and sound art. And again, it's been mentioned uh, a couple of times already, Notes on Blindness, um, it's out there in the exhibition. Uh, a great example of how audio stories and sound art um, can be used to create a completely new type of art form. Um, number two, go slow. A recent study into empathy in VR done by the Media Lab in Amsterdam seems to indicate how audiences in VR feel most empathy during scenes where nothing or very little is happening in terms of story and interactivity. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we need to create more nothing in VR? Does that mean uh, that we have to give people a chance for their mind to wander in the headset and find a more personal connection to the content instead of distracting them with what we want to tell them? Um, I'm not sure, and I think it's, it goes back to the debate as well that we had uh, yesterday around differences between journalism and documentary and poetic art. Uh, I think there's a place for everything and a time for everything and a device for everything, um, or a medium or a, a, uh, a use of that. Um, but personally, I'm definitely uh, really interested in how we can turn nonfiction uh, into more than just journalism uh, and really as an art form, into an art form, and I think in terms of the going slow, the work of Felix and Paul has been a great testament to this. By showing us the transcendent beauty of a single shot uh, in Strangers, it does something that uh, we actually forgot to do in traditional documentary as well, many times. And it actually made me think of one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, Viktor Kozakowski, um, who said a couple of years ago, and this is the obligatory train reference in there, um, but still, remember that cinema was invented as one single shot, a documentary shot, by the way, a documentary shot, by the way, and without any story, or the story was just inside that shot. And for those of you who don't know Viktor Kozakowski's work, on a side note, he's still alive. He's made uh, uh, around ten films, which I think are um, required watching for everybody working in any art form. Um, and I can't wait for. Uh, more artists like that to move into this space. I think we've had amazing pioneers, but just like in the beginning with interactive documentary, I think it was so important, for instance, when David Lynch worked with his son together on the first web series, or one of the first web series, um, it really brought something to the medium um, in a way that sometimes us pioneers or the people f tinkering and fiddling uh, with things um, are unable to bring yet. <coughs> Number three, um, participation is awkward. Um, I think everybody who's ever been to an immersive theater show as a kid knows that. Um, and I would say is avoid it. Um, or if you actually do go that route and invite the audience to co-create the, the artwork with you, go all the way. And a great example for that to me is uh, Be Another Lab. In the machine to be, uh, the machine to be another, an installation uh, that they've been traveling the world with, it allows you to switch bodies, naked or clothed, and literally see yourself through someone else's eyes. It's probably still one of the best examples of going all the way in VR. Uh, I guess we've all seen the gender swap video um, that went around the web. If not, Google gender swap. Um, 
Machine to be another is a two-person experience, but as mentioned yesterday, it's super interesting to see how quickly multi-user VR is developing. It's something we're exploring a lot at ITFA as well, both inside and outside VR. For instance, last November, we did a couple of non-VR crowd experiments, and if we have time left, um, we might try one uh, here as well. Another exciting trend in both VR and non-VR projects is biometric technology experiments. We especially like experience where the technology is not used as, a, as an interface, um, but in combination with people bringing personal experiences. So, for instance, like trying to feel something as hard as you can, what happens if you invite people to do that? Um, an illustration of that is the Emotional Arcade, a project that we commissioned Brent Hoff to make in 2013. <laughs> was chill and I didn't think of anything I thought of nothing cool sunsets sunrises the first time I was down here when we were at the beach I got like tons of pictures and stuff I was thinking about Benny's chewing crackers my target emotion was lust and I was thinking of passion and desire My targeted emotion was rage. I, I play a lot of video games and I, I get mad at that a lot. My emotion was bliss and I got there by looking at my nephew competing against me and smiling. My grandfather, my sister, and actually my dancing family. But at the same time, like, I knew what the balloon was about to pop, so I was giggling. Um, I guess on a side note, um, when playing with biometric technology and neuroscience and all those types of things in the art world, I think there's always sort of a... a a disconnect between uh, artists and scientists, whether how scientifically viable is it what artists are doing with this technology, uh, the claims that some of the artists are making about around the technology um, can vary from downright lies to somewhat hopeful claims. Um, and I think it's really interesting if you're doing projects like these to find ways to address that, not by going uh, um, giving up and saying, oh, we never get it to scientifically viable. Um, but actually finding ways that you can use these technologies to create meaningful experiences for the audience. Um, the Emotion Arcade, I think, is a great example of uh, taking completely uh, a very limited technology of like EEG scanners that, even though like scientists at Harvard were working on it to tweak it, um, it basically couldn't tell the difference between lust or rage. Um, but it didn't matter because the audience got the question, they choo they, uh, which emotion do you want to choose and which emotion do you think you can feel uh, uh, hardest on, on cue? That process within an audience, like negotiating which uh, emotion they were going to do and actually interviewing them afterwards and asking what type of strategies they've been using to feel a specific emotion, that's where like amazing documentary stories happened. And w I think the biggest mistake that we made was not recording those. Um, and it's just to show that uh, you can use sort of these new technologies without it being scientifically uh, viable and still be meaningful as art. Um, <coughs> finally, as an example of participation, uh, I'd love to show Cape by Crew. Who knows this project, actually? Uh, Cape by Crew, it's a Flemish theater. <laughs> of course. <laughs> It's always one and it's always that one. Um, <laughs> so, um, Crew is a Flemish VR theater company. Um, they were working on VR uh, back when Nani was working on it on her own. 
um, they were doing really strange immersive theater experiences in VR. And because it was so expensive and they were making, uh, um, working in a theater background, just like Nani working in a journalism background, they got incredibly inventive in l looking for the limitations of the technology. And I still, this experience, um, what it was is, so this is 2010, pre-Oculus, uh, some sort of weird Chinese hardware hacked. Um, and what it would do is it would create, um, you would walk around in a 360 video, which only works if your body moves at the same moment that the camera moved in the video itself. So what they did was they gave you a helper in the video who would actually be pulling the camera and they gave you a person, a volunteer, who would be helping you um, uh, make exactly the same movements. It's something that can we, we can all do very easily right now. Uh, we just don't think about it because we see VR as something like that could be, that should be distributed as a file. But why not build an installation only? Uh, because in most cases, the artists are still standing next to their work at exhibitions <laughs> because they're tweaking it. So. Um, I have to move quickly, so four, on point, don't try to do everything at once. As awesome as VR uh, is combined with AI characters, haptic suits, smells, conveyor bel belts and wind machines, true immersion is not about creating the perfect illusion of reality. Our brains are perfectly capable of suspending disbelief on their own. And well orchestrated forms of sensory deprivation, instead of catering to every sense at once, is actually a great way to create immersion. Um, one of my favorite things we ever done with um, Amy Rose and May Abdallah from Am Anagram at South by Southwest. They created, uh, I think, one of the most immersive experiences I've had the pleasure to witness using uh, basically a blindfold, a piece of fruit, um, and some audio files. <coughs> and that leads me to my final point, which is a question. Uh, what does VR actually suck at? Every medium that we love has at least one thing that it doesn't do. For instance, books and literature suck at providing moving images, leaving it to our brain to convert letters into wonderful images, which makes uh, books such deeply personal and immersive experiences. Films, as opposed to theatrical performance, suck at creating a visceral life experience, which in turn enables us to become the perfect voyeur, crying and falling in love much more easily with people on the screen without uh, fearing some unwanted eye contact. So what does VR suck at? What is it not capable of doing? Actually, I don't have the answer, and I would love to hear if anybody has any thoughts on it. Um, but I still think it's, it's a meaningful question as we move forward uh, to not just think what VR can do and what it can bring, but actually what is it not capable of? Because maybe that's also where some of its true beauty lie. Um, and that's also why we're starting a new thing called the Immersive Nonfiction Network. Um, it consists of research and UX testing, commission projects and network events, which uh, has the goal to connect different people who explore the art of immersive media and its place in the physical world. I hope to see you all in November at ITVA Doc Lab in Amsterdam. And please let us know if you're interested to become part of the Immersive Nonfiction Network. And if you're working on some sort of inflatable multi-user VR experience with pulleys and levers, please let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have time? Yeah.